Henry VIII is known for being a rather notorious and savage king, who executed 70,000 people throughout his almost four decade long reign on the throne. We know him most famously for his six wives, and the fact that two of them, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, were executed in bloody fashion, being beheaded inside the walls of the Tower of London. Henry VIII spent lavishly during his time on the throne, as did a number of his queens, and he spent much money on his royal court, hosting huge banquets and also impressing others in huge spectacles. He also spent lots of money on wars, however one of his biggest and most impressive building projects was to create a huge palace, one referred to as non-such, because no other palace in the kingdom would be equal to it. Today we look at Henry VIII's lost palace, non-such palace, and remember as always to support, please make sure to subscribe. When Henry VIII ordered the creation of non-such palace, the plan was for this castle and palace to be the most lavish, beautiful and extravagant in the whole of England. It was called non-such to emphasise that there was no other like it, the castle that would have no rival as it was so superior. On the 13th anniversary of his accession to the throne, the 22nd of April 1538, Henry planned to build a remarkable palace and residence for his young son, Prince Edward, who would become the future Edward VI. Its site was researched and identified with designers sent out to search for the best place for the lavish palace. Designers then approached the king and presented him with this huge and impressive structure. The place found for the palace was Cuddington, a village in Surrey. It had been inhabited since the Anglo-Saxon period and was referred to in the Doomsday Book. But in 1538, Henry VIII purchased the manor of Coddington from the owners, and the whole former village which had a mansion and church inside of it were demolished and knocked down to make way for the palace and its two parks that came with it. If the king wanted the land, everyone was forced out. The only problem the king faced was Merton Priory, which protected the church, but one week before building, the priory was dissolved and its stone was used in the construction of the palace. Work started in late April 1538, and within a few months the foundations of Nonsuch Palace were finished. The workforce to create the King's Palace was huge, with 500 construction workers from all over Europe being employed to work on the site. The order to build Henry this palace at great haste was achieved. In the Middle Ages it took decades and decades to build castles, but at some point the palace was quickly completed. By late 1541 the structural work was completed, but the work continued for years inside, furnishing the interiors and designing it. The builders gave Henry the palace he required and greatly wished for, and it was designed to be a celebration of the Tudor dynasty and the extravagant and riches of Henry VIII. It was also built to rival the French king's chateaus, and it was brand new. The palace cost at least £24,000, which in today's money would be well over £10 million. It contained great riches, and only the best interior furnishings, and it was seen as a celebration of Renaissance architecture. Over 36,000 loads of chalk and stone were brought to the site for the foundations and the masonry walls. The palace was absolutely huge. It was split into two different courts, the inner and the outer court, that formed the beautiful inner gardens and courtyards, similar to many palaces in England. The outer gatehouse guarded the entrance to the palace, and there was a kitchen attached to the side of the wall, which would have been in charge of feeding the king in his lavish banquets. Lodgings were kept on the western side of the outer court, where members of the royal court would stay, but inside of the inner court was where most of the state apartments could be found. In the west of the inner court were the king's stairs, opposite the queen's in the eastern part, as well as two presence chambers that were found opposite each other. The interesting thing about non-such is that the King and Queen's apartments mirrored each other on the west and east side of the castle. There were two small chapels, as well as privy closets followed by the privy chamber, where only the closest advisers would be given access. The King and Queen's bedchambers were kept the furthest away from the outer gatehouse, in the south, and were flanked by two towers and one central tower. They would have been connected to each other, and a gallery was kept outside of the bedchambers. The kitchens were kept outside of the main castle's walls, possibly for safety, to ensure if there was a fire then it could be isolated before affecting the main castle. These were created similarly to how the kitchens are at Hampton Court, with cellars also found below to store food. Access to the inner court was gained through a gatehouse, and inside of the inner court was a fountain, 
most probably beautiful gardens that the king could enjoy at his leisure. But Henry VIII would not enjoy none such palace to the maximum of its potential, as he would die in 1547, having visited only three times, twice in 1545, and once a year he died. The palace that was intended for his son Edward was considered by him a waste of money. Edward showed very little interest in non such, and for this it was left, and was in an incomplete state following the king's death. The palace that cost a huge amount was just left standing, and in 1556, Queen Mary I, the eldest child of Henry VIII, sold non such palace to Henry Fitzalan, the 19th Earl of Arundel, who finished the palace off. Arundel installed fountains and statues in the grounds, and placed lots of art on the walls of the palace. After Thomas Cranmer was burned at the stake, Arundel was given Cranmer's library, which he kept there, and it became the second largest private library in England. When Elizabeth I came onto the throne, she frequented non such palace a number of times. Arundel held a huge party when she became queen, and she often went to the palace for a number of different activities. It was here where Elizabeth signed the Treaty of non such on the 10th of August 1585. This was the first international treaty signed by the Dutch Republic, in which Elizabeth agreed to supply thousands of soldiers and cavalry, led by the Earl of Leicester, Robert Dudley, to fight and relieve the siege of Antwerp and limit Spanish influence. The treaty was seen by Philip II of Spain as a declaration of war by Elizabeth, beginning the Anglo-Spanish War, and he would later launch a Spanish Armada. Elizabeth later bought the palace when the Earl of Arundel died, and she spent every summer there, hunting in the grounds. She was the only monarch who did spend a large amount of time at the palace. After her reign, James I gave the palace to his wife, and later Charles I would gift Nonsuch Palace to his wife Henrietta Maria. During the Civil War she used it as a refuge, but it saw very little action, only a small skirmish broke out near to a banqueting house. By 1650 Nonsuch Palace had fallen into disrepair, and it was then sold before being handed back to the Crown, during the Restoration. Charles II gave it to his mistress and awarded her the title Baroness of Nonsuch, but to pay off gambling debts, she had the palace pulled down and then sold off the stone and building materials to pay the debt off. So around 130 years after building work began, the huge and expensive palace of Nonsuch was demolished. Some parts were used in other buildings and some remains are held in the British Museum, but today nothing remains of the palace site and there are no remains left there. Non such palace was an incredibly expensive Tudor building project, costing well over £10 million in today's money. It was the third most expensive Tudor building created behind the Palace of Whitehall and Hampton Court, but today nothing stands of the palace Henry wished so much to represent the Tudor monarchy so well. He wished for the palace to represent the strength, wealth and power of the Tudors, but it was never really lived in, only frequented mostly by Elizabeth I during her reign. It's a shame that today nothing remains of non such palace, as it would be incredibly beautiful and lavish, similar to how Hampton Court is today. It really is the lost palace of King Henry VIII. Once again, thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.